I am pleased to see this turnout today, going back almost a year to when I had lunch with Tim Coates, then the managing director of CT Next. Our objective was to create an event that would be a big tent. And as I look across the audience today, I see mobile developers, mobile investors, mobile end users, uh, mobile service providers, mobile developers, and it makes my heart glad that we have this great turnout for the first annual Connecticut Mobile Summit. Last year, mobile data demand grew at 81%. And Cisco Visual Networking, which is the gold standard for research in this area, projects 61% compound <coughs> annual growth rate through 2018, and I believe it will be double digit beyond that as well. We have the ability to enhance revenues, drive productivity using, leveraging the existing resources of those big companies at the same time growing young enterprise mobile solutions of the sort that we're going to hear from the panelists today. 30% of all mobile data demand is enterprise mobility and that's what this panel is about and why we chose to focus on this as the first of uh, our future series. So today we have at the panel here the very tip of that 15 to 22 percent compound annual growth rate <coughs> that crosses industries. Retail, big data, um, the livery business, taxi and limousine, and also molecular diagnostics. Multi-billion dollar markets represented here and the ability to uh, grow as far as the eye can see. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Carissa Ganelli, CEO and founder of Lightning Buy. Good morning. So um, how many people have heard of Google Wallet, <coughs> ISIS, NFC? Yeah? So Lightning Buy is none of those things. We're not an app either, OK? So what we are is a mobile and social monetization pro platform for enterprises. So before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about me and our team. I come from, I've been doing all digital since 1999. I was vice president at Digitas. And I saw firsthand the growth of mobile. Just three years ago, traffic to e-commerce retailer sites from mobile devices was 2%. Anybody know what it is today? 40%, three years. Okay, growth, traffic growth from mobile devices to e-com retailer site went from two to 40% in just three years. Okay. My co-founder, Jeffrey O, is a turnaround sales guy, turnaround sales guru. He actually started his career at AT&T. And what he likes to say is it harder to start something that's desperately needed in the marketplace or to turn around a failing company. So I knew he was the right guy to partner with. And my CTO, Stephanie, um, started out, as, she's a payment and e-commerce expert. She started out building e-com systems and uh, payment systems. And she pioneered voice technology, voice recognition technology when she was at Bose. Mobile commerce is gonna hit $87 billion by 2017. So in 2013, 29% of holiday purchases <coughs> came from mobile devices, okay? 30% of the actual purchases came from mobile devices. I know what you're saying. Well, that was tablets. And tablet behavior is like PC behavior, so that makes sense. No, well, you're not actually, that's not actually correct. You know, a large percentage of that 29% actually came from smartphones. Two years ago when I started talking to people about raising money to start, I can't tell you the number of angel investors and VCs that I talked to and I pitched <laughs> who said, Nobody's ever going to buy anything from mobile. You know any of those? Were any of you that guy or girl? Let's talk about where mobile is in terms of driving revenue to these e-com retailers. 78% of Facebook users access Facebook from a phone. 76% of Twitter users access it from a phone. 75% of Pinterest users. So social is mobile. There's no such thing as social anymore. It actually is mobile now. Okay, one third of Google paid search clicks come from a phone. The problem is e-commerce retailers are not set up for this. Barnes & Noble, it takes 19 screens to make a purchase. Four and a half minutes to make a purchase, okay? With Lightning Buy, 44 seconds. Single screen. Lightning Buy is a single click mobile checkout. We started, the idea was, you know how easy it is to buy something from iTunes from your phone? 
Right now, easy to have your kids buy something from a phone and you get a $900 bill. The idea was to make purchasing as easy for everybody else as it was to make a purchase from iTunes. Lightning Buy is not an app and it's browser based. A pass through platform so there's no inventory risk. There's no registration required for consumers because we know how much they love to do that, right? They love to register, keep a password. Was it eight characters and an ampersand or was it uppercase and lowercase? And I have no idea. Um, it's white label, it's a SaaS model and we have a patent pending. So with Lightning Buy now, all of these retailers that are getting the majority of their purchases and traffic activity from all those properties that I showed you before can sell with a single click. So you can sell within the Facebook environment, within the Twitter environment, without ever leaving Facebook, Twitter, or Pinterest, or your email. You can make a purchase in a single click. Okay, so we have our patent was filed in uh, May 2011. And what the patent hinges on is that you can have the single click experience without a pre-existing account. That's why we don't violate the Amazon patent, because I know some of you are sitting there going, yeah, Amazon, Amazon, she's in big trouble. Not really. We bring the purchase to the consumer where they are, where they want to in uh, interact, and we capture the impulse purchase at the point of the impulse. Okay, the other big thing when we talked a little bit about our future plans is that we enable upsell. So you're not just buying the product that they showed you in the Facebook post or the Google search results, but we can upsell you and cross-sell you. We also have the capability to do a universal shopping cart. So how would you like to be able to, in a single click, purchase some, the blue blazer from Brooks Brothers, that evening gown for your wife, the um, Bed Bath & Beyond wedding registry, all in a single transaction? Isn't a phone all about voice? So wouldn't it be great to just say, lightning buy, Brooks Brothers, blue blazer? Wouldn't that be awesome? So that's what we're going to be working on in the future. We can launch without any retailer involvement. We do not even need to talk to the IT department to be able to implement Lightning Buy on the behalf of our clients. All right, we launched our alpha with buy.com. We never even spoke to them. We built Victoria's Secret because we were pitching them, and we never even spoke to them. So we have enough tech resources to launch one client a month. You know how many we had this month? And I'm living it right now? Four. Okay, so we, and we're selling, we're signing three more in the next two weeks, you know, God willing. And um, so, you know, there's a delay now. We have an eight to 10 week queue for tech dev, right? So it'd be nice for us to raise money so we can accelerate our growth, All right? Um, marketing approach, acquisition, hiring. Um, and if anybody knows, uh, you know, e-commerce merchants, we'd love to have the introduction. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to talk mostly about is information and accessing information that is relevant to us. So in this, this, this demonstration here is showing everybody here is accessing, whether it be a football coach, medical, student, they're accessing what are actually huge databases of information, either as big as Google or a large enterprise um, solution. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to get what's relevant to them. And the more and more information that we have, the more and more harder this gets to get what we're looking for quickly and easily. So when we did this, we looked at a couple of key components that we thought was important to understanding a news event. <clears throat> One of them was, how did it develop over time? How did it get here? Um, multiple perspective. So in the sense of uh, uh, the news, it's actually one of the most corrupt forms of data, no pun intended, but one side will say this event is fantastic and the other side will say it's terrible. We're talking about the same event. So getting the multiple perspectives so that the individual can make a decision was very important. And the other thing was too was to visualize the impact and reach of that this particular event that I'm looking at has on other themes and topics. So we thought these were key components in getting a better understanding of, the, of, the, of what we're interested in. What's going to be the new revolutionary product? Is it wearables? Is it automotive? <clears throat> the overall deal was, it's actually, how are we going to deal with all this stuff? And Bill had talked about the Internet of Things. So if I can look at my thermostat, am I tying my thermostat to my buying of my oil, my fuel consumption, what is it connected to? Now I have even more data to, content, to look through and understand. So for us, when we had built the news app, we had actually touched on a new way of categorizing and displaying information. And what we had started to look at was, because we had created a new way of looking at information, 
we started to figure out, well, what else can we do with it? So first thing we do is we look at information a little bit differently. We take every object that's out there, and the first thing is, is it's made up into multiple dimensions of relevancy to the individual. So whatever thing I present up here, whatever object, different people in the room are going to have different aspect of what they're interested in. So that's the first thing we do. Um, with the patent and talking to enterprise players out there that were interested in what we were doing, we actually created an information management system. The key thing is, and the magic of what we created is, we looked at information in a whole new way. What it was all about when we were doing the news app was finding what's relevant to the user and giving them the choices to go deeper, easier. So again, the magic is, is more intuitively connected. With all this data we have now, we have this huge, uh, that's just growing by the day. Bill said six billion texts a day. You know, that's just, everything is just growing at a quick pace. So we think we have this value, but how are we gonna tap it? Because if my people can't access it, I'm not gaining that value. And the other thing is too, is being able to differentiate yourself from your competition in what they're working on. Our business model, as we're dealing with this, you know, this pivot of um, keeping the Track 180 as a news app going that way. But what we did is we took the, the technology that we had developed and we'd run with it and, and formed it as Kazar. We're seeing numerous opportunities in a variety of verticals because it, what I didn't realize when I was working on the news space, it was a new way, efficient way of categorizing all data. So we found that the more complex the data is, like medical, that is where we're seeing the greatest value of being able to see if I change this a little bit, what is the ripples from that? What are the implications? So as we're moving forward, um, we are currently talking with channel partners. We are meeting with additional team members now. Um, we are expanding uh, our development base. And as a small business, we're always willing to talk to investors. If anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to contact me afterwards. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so our goal at Tangent Biosciences is, is to uh, develop uh, molecular diagnostics, but on a mobile platform, which is uh, kind of a space that's very wide open right now. Uh, no good uh, mobile instruments are capable of that kind of uh, diagnosis. Um, we have obviously lofty goals since we're, we're an early entry into this market. It's, um, it's a very fragmented market. There's, there's really no leader at this point. Um, my background is um, DNA sequencing design. I worked for the companies in Brantford that sort of started the DNA sequencing revolution and uh, so did my partner, uh, biochemist uh, JD, sitting over there. Um, so, so what our experience was, was that um, we, built these devices that do DNA sequencing, and the reason it's revolutionary is because it's cheap and it's fast. So this enormous database of DNA information is being very rapidly developed. And um, what we wanted to do was connect that to uh, diagnostics that could be done in real time in the field, and by doing that, change uh, the paradigm for how disease is diagnosed and treated. A couple of years ago, there was an E. coli outbreak in uh, Germany and it was a new strain and it wasn't understood and it was uh, isolated and within a couple of days it was sequenced on one of our instruments. So it was great. They understood exactly why this strain was more dangerous, how it had mutated, but still there was no quick <coughs> test developed to, to find out who's got it, is it spreading. Uh, it was uh, all based on lab testing that took a long time and that, that's not an efficient way to treat an, an emerging outbreak. Um, so we think there's a, a wide open market opportunity here because of the port portability and the mobility of our device. Um, this is a huge, huge market, um, you know, 36 billion, that's just the diagnostics market. The DNA based is 8 billion, it's growing very quickly. Um, and the reason we uh, like the DNA based uh, diagnostic market is because it's the most specific way to identify any uh, anything that's been alive. So we, there's a, once you make an instrument that could identify DNAs accurately, you can uh, use it for many, many applications. And they, these are just some of the possible applications of our device. Uh, military, our device um, could be revolutionary because a soldier can carry it in his pocket rather than on you know, the back of a Humvee, which is what they do now. 
Um, water quality, that's a great example, because now when they go down to the beach to determine if the water is safe, if there's some kind of bacteria in the tide, they send the water sample away, and a couple of days later, if they get an answer, of course, that tide is gone. The answer is meaningless because it, the contamination changes every tide. So they, they could, you could use our mobile device, get an answer immediately. It, it would be uh, uploaded to a, a, a cloud, basically, <laughs> where whoever we allow or whatever the system is set up to do could be tracked in real time. There could be thousands of instruments everywhere. So anything our instruments are detecting, because it's mobile, it's real time, we know where the instrument is, we know when it did the test, we know what the test is, it will allow a, a huge amount of a very, very relevant data uh, in real time to be, to be accessible. Um, farm safety, that allows, um, that, that's a uh, big market because right now you, your farmer doesn't want to wait until the uh, uh, USDA comes in to see if they have a problem. They, with our device, it's very low cost, it's simple to use, they could track their own information. Um, food safety, similar, food fraud is a huge new market. Animal disease, that's a big market also, but human disease is really where we focused on because we wanted our device to have the biggest possible impact. Um, some of the, uh, some applications are more sensitive to time and location than others, but human disease is very important to track when it's happening, where it's happening, to make sure you can stay ahead of any kind of outbreak and, and understand the impact of your treatment. So we ended up zeroing in on tuberculosis because it's a very expensive, long-term disease to treat. It's, uh, it's very difficult to diagnose now. The existing diagnostic protocol is uh, 100 years old. Someone looking at a microscope and trying to see if there's TB bacteria, it's not, a, it's not a very good test. What we found out very early on in this project is that the WHO has been looking for this product for, uh, since 2006. They've described it exactly, uh, the requirements, it has to be infrastructure free, you have to be able to carry it around, um, portable mobile, um, quick result. If, if it takes 24 hours to get a result, you can't have a patient waiting around for 24 hours. There's another uh, first world reason why a fast result is very important, and that is isolation. If someone comes into Yale New Haven and they're suspected of TB, they immediately get isolated, they get tested, they found out a couple days later. Isolation is very expensive, so even though there's only maybe 100 cases a year in Connecticut, we might spend you know, could be millions of dollars spending isolating uh, hundreds and hundreds of people um, while you're waiting for your test. If you can tell them immediately, that's much, it's better for the patient, it's better for the community. It's, it's a handheld device, it's not really much bigger than a smartphone, it's thicker, but not really bigger. Um, again, the user can carry it in their pocket, and uh, this will, uh, it, the design spec now is for a Bluetooth device, so it'll talk to a mobile phone with an application, so periodically, it will upload um, test results. There'll be anonymized results, but so you can do real-time tracking and where the disease is being diagnosed and what the rate of positive diagnoses are. And this is very valuable. The WHO spends millions of dollars every year trying to uh, just tracking these diseases is, is a huge burden. Uh, when the test is done in a lab, you you lose the time of the diagnosis and the location. There isn't a um, uh, data format that captures everything the way it needs to be captured. So uh, our devices will automatically be reporting everywhere they're used, so there'll be a good real-time knowledge of uh, disease outbreak. Um, so we came up with our own uh, technology specifically designed to make sure our instrument is small and cheap and, and fast <coughs> and does multiple tests so we, we can actually look for multiple diseases or multiple strains of a disease, um, which is very important because if, if someone does come in with a cough, and it's TB is suspected, if it's not TB, it'd be nice to know what it is. So we can, with one sample from the patient, we can do, uh, right now with our instrument prototype, we can do 16 tests, but we think we could probably do even more if we push the technology a little bit. So, um, so our test is 80% lower than the existing test, and that alone is reason for them to, uh, for WHO and FINE for, to, to fund us. So the way we're trying to market this is um, through, uh, these NGO partnerships is, is really the key. All these organizations listed are, are very interested in this disease and are spending a lot of money trying to find a better way to, to diagnose it. After the founders investments, we, we started actually uh, fall 2012. We, um, we worked with Connecticut Innovations and uh, we got a pre-seed investment, which is what we're working through now. So we're now starting to think about our, our seed round to, to keep us going to the point where we can get a uh, a larger grant from uh, one of the organizations probably find that will uh, help us with this particular market. However, 
the nice thing about our product is once we can identify things with DNA, we can identify anything with DNA, and so there are lot, lots of other market opportunities for us in, in the meantime. That's it. Thank you. Hey guys, I'm Nadav Ullman, uh, from CEO of Dashride. Okay, so I introduce my team real quick. We're all UConn graduates. We all came from a previous driver logistic company called Sobrio, as Brenda mentioned. And um, Dashride, the initial seed of Dashride actually came as a pivot from uh, Sobrio. Okay, so let me give you a quick background on the taxi and limousine industry right now. There's 200,000 companies in this $10 billion industry, and they're all using really antiquated software. At the same time, there's these huge disruptions in the industry by tech companies like Uber and Lyft and Sidecar. In the last seven years, they've gained almost 10% of this market. And what that leaves is 90% of this market that are now looking for the tools to compete. There's 200,000 companies that antiquated software that are now looking for mobile dispatching software. So that's what we're offering. We're offering this mobile technology for this huge industry and at the same time, in the process of selling that, offering them an end-to-end -end back solution for their office to manage everything from booking to billing. A good way to describe it is essentially a white-labeled Uber in a box for all these independent owners. Quick rundown of how our product works. We offer customized mobile application for these companies to offer their clients to be able to uh, request rides right into their system. We offer them a web widget to throw right on their website for their clients to request rides right from their website and go into their system. We're offering a dispatching portal that lets them auto-dispatch all these rides so they don't have to do any call center activity and go right to the drivers. And we're offering them a driver app as well. And on this driver app, these drivers can organize, offer, and manage their rides right from their phones so they don't have to deal with the old radios. So here's some of the benefits of the livery companies, which is the taxi and limo companies. Uh, we're reducing their dispatching costs by up to 60%. We're improving their, their driver efficiency by 25%. And we're facilitating company growth. So these companies are also entering into a larger affiliate program. So they designate a certain territory where they operate. If someone uses their mobile technology outside of the territory, it goes into our larger clientele who can then bid for lead gen. Here's our market opportunity, as I mentioned. It's a $10 billion industry right now. There's 198,000 companies, and this is a growing industry as well. Um, of the companies who are currently purchasing uh, dispatching software over four drivers, it's $5.5 .5 billion in transactions every year. Competitive landscape, real quick. The breadth of offering, by that we're talking about mobile uh, people who are offering mobile software with their dispatching solutions. Uh, really, of these, the only companies that's offering mobile with that is Taxi Caller, and uh, we, uh, you see the other, the vertical here is uh, user-friendly, and they're having a lot of backwards compatibility issues. It's poor design. Um, all these old dispatching companies have a really hard time integrating mobile into it, and the mobile technology is really what these companies are looking for. Quick milestones. So we launched the actual product for Dashride about a month ago. We have our first six paying clients already, and we have three on the free, free trial, which we expect to convert to paying customers in the next week. So we're moving super fast. These data points are also um, already off a little bit. We just opened up our angel round. We're raising a million dollars. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards if you guys want to touch base about it.
John, how about you? partner attended and uh, my future partner at the time I should say and uh, we were we started out actually even more directly mobile our idea was well why can't you just do kind of a white line test you know like a pregnancy style test and use a, uh, a smartphone just take a picture of it and have the data analyzed and so our product would be a piece of paper and an app right with the chem paper with the chemistry on it and what we quickly realized once we really dug into the science, it's, the first question is why hasn't someone done that? And it turns out someone tried to do it, there's a good reason. Um, it comes down to the science and the technology and the specificity and what, what kind of, the test has to be as good as a lab test. That was our goal. If the test isn't as good as a lab test, then it, it's kind of useless. So we realized, okay, we have to do some fluid handling, we have to handle a sample from the patient, either blood or saliva or whatever, and we have to process it and, and do some good chemistry, so do some biochemistry on it. So at that point, we had to build a special instrument. So we said, well, the instrument could still be as mobile as, as it was, but we can't succeed in this field without a high quality instrument. That goes a result that clinicians and the FDA and the, the customer can trust. So that's how it evolved into, into a separate product. All right. Drew? <clears throat> well, my background was troubleshooting in hardware. I, in my bio, I, I built elevators for many years and grew some companies that way. Um, It'd be the water cooler conversation. You're talking about what's going on in news and somebody's presenting data that's part of the data. Well, without the other part of the data, this, the whole story isn't there. And so I thought it'd be with all the information we have out there, um, we started to test, you know, let's, let's get the whole story. And it was taking about an hour of research on Google, multiple sources depending on what country they were in and whatnot. And so that's when we started to go after the news app. So in some of you, there might be some familiar faces when I was pitching the news app, and I, I got a lot of feedback that was, this seems something cool underneath it, but the media space, Drew, you don't want to be there. And so um, right, right around the time we got the announcement of the patent was when, um, through some of the patent attorneys uh, that we were working with, said, Drew, this is actually an amazing patent. It's extremely broad. It's not a typical algorithm patent. And uh, so we worked at the CRM company, and they, the response was just amazing, and we said, wow, we gotta, we gotta do something with this new company. And uh, we, we had to change the name for, for what we're doing with the enterprise side because we would say Track 180 and people would look up a news app and say, well, how's the news app gonna help me? So um, that was how, cause Zark was, the branding and whatnot was there. But the, the, initial, the initial problem was just too much information and how do I get what's relevant? And um, so there are we are. Are you gonna tell us what Kazark means? Kazark is, uh, is actually for being here in, in, in Connecticut, it's a Mark Twain word. And there's a great, uh, one of Mark Twain's last stories he wrote was called Excerpts from Captain Stormsfield Visit to Heaven. And uh, for the trivia of Mark Twain, Mark Twain was born on Halley's Comet and he died on Halley's Comet. Well, the interesting thing is Captain Stormfield is driving a comet through the universe on his way to go visit heaven. And as he's running through the space, uh, he ends up racing another vessel. And, um, that vessel was carrying an unlimited amount of brimstone for Hades, and uh, it was measured in Kazark's, and Kazark was a bulk equal to 169 worlds like ours, so it was a volume. So we went with Kazark based on, uh, a Kazark was a, an enormous amount of bulk, and for us, Kazark was an amazing way to navigate huge amounts of information. So. Uh, Yes, I am a little bit of a history buff, and if you do go to our site, <laughs> if you go to our site, you'll see the actual emblem that we have. There's actually Captain Stormfield. That is the image from his um, his his short story, and he died right after it. So it's uh, quite a metaphor of the Mark Twain. So that's great. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to describe what has been your greatest challenge to date, and what you think going forward, looking out, say five years, you perceive as the greatest challenge for your specific company. John, will you start us off? Sure, um, I would say a big challenge for us has been, um, uh, so, so we're a technology-based company, it's bio, bioscience, basically, and finding investors who really could appreciate the science of what we're doing. And the reason you have to, it helps to appreciate that is you realize why it hasn't been done and how we're competitive and how we're better and how a device like this can, can be a game changer. If, if you don't really understand what's different and how it can be applied and because once you understand it your mind really opens up and you're like there's unlimited applications because it's small because it's fast because it's cheap because it's mobile 
and based on what it's capable of doing. But it, 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 you know, if you talk to a typical technology investor, um, they get turned off because they don't understand the science. Luckily, the people at a Connecticut Innovations, we were hooked up with some very good scientists who understand exactly what we were doing, and, and, that, was, and that was great. And, um, and the other side of it is that pharma investors, you know, they say, oh, it's biotechnology, it's pharma, that's a 10-year turnaround. You know, it's too long a horizon for anybody, except a, you know, $100 billion pharma company, but it's not pharma, it's a device. Devices are engineered quickly and, and used typically a year or less, and, and, they're, and it's a totally different time cycle, totally different return on investment, but if you don't understand that, you're, you're not gonna invest. So, so that's the challenge, is finding the, the people who, who can understand that. And you that. anticipate that going forward as well to be the major stumbling block for you? Um, as you're looking out in the five year time frame? The five year time frame, I'd say the next challenge is getting the, uh, the big, the, uh, the, um, the VC, depending on what path, whether we go with a, uh, a, um, a foundational path where we get our money to basically finish the product from a foundation that's interested in, or if we, or if it gets funded by a large company or, or a VC. Right. We're not sure what path we're going to go on, so I think it makes people nervous. I think that it's great we have lots of options, lots, lots of paths, but investors might be like, pick a path and show me how you're going to do it. So that, that's a challenge. Right. Nadav, what about you? What kind of challenge have you encountered to date, and what do you foresee looking out in that five-year horizon as your greatest challenge? Sure. So I guess to date, one of the really big things is um, adding a new team member or hiring has been a really big challenge. Now, by the time you realize you need someone else to join the team, <coughs> You know, it's really you should have had them a month and a half ago, and then it takes another month and a half to get them on the team. And um, when you're a really small company, uh, you know, you know, going from four to five or five to six is, is so huge, and that one person is so important. You have to find someone who's really specifically good at what you're looking for, but also a generalist who could do everyone else's job, um, and also someone who needs to fit into the culture. And um, so, it just, at, you know, at just this kind of early stage, it's a really big risk bringing someone on. So that's big one of the challenges to date, and it's something that we're actually going through right now as well. Um, looking forward, I think it's more of like, um, I'm thinking more of a fundamental challenge, um, which is more of the, you know, the idea of the innovator's dilemma, where, um, you know, you know, the reason we're creating this is obviously this is something that is superior to anything else in the market, but five years out, it's not, you know, the software like this becomes antiquated quickly, and so the idea is to uh, have it continually enhance really quickly and make sure that you're one step ahead of the game at all times. So even though we believe that's where we are now, you know, this same product won't be in five years, so it's gonna to have to be a constant innovation. Adaptation. Yeah. Carissa? So our biggest challenge to date was um, being early to the market. And um, so a couple of examples, you know, when we first launched and we got some beta clients and we had proof of concept, if anybody told me that it was gonna take eight months to get the next client, I would have thought they were insane. I mean, wh what are you waiting for? I've just proved, I've done this, I've got beta clients, you know, what's your problem? So that was a big, you know, big learning for me. And um, the other thing about being early tech, I, some of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> so another um, a big challenge being early to the market was when we were calling on some of these accounts, they would say to us, and this is a real example, we do, we're a $150 million company, we do $60,000 worth of revenue from mobile today. Even if you double it, it's not even worth my time. You know what I'm talking about. And how do you respond to that? Well, it's gonna be important in three years and we have to get there first and your job is gonna depend on it in three years. Okay, call me in three years. You know, he called us two months ago and they're in our tech deck queue. Right? So it was being early to the market. And in terms of future growth, I would echo what Nadav was saying. One is the hiring, and we're in that spot right now where you know, we should have had double the size of our tech team two months ago, but given how long it took us to get to this critical mass of clients, you know, it's a good thing we didn't have that overhead. Um, and then the future technology, because I mentioned the voice technology. I mean, with Bill's watch, nobody's gonna be keying in their credit card on a two-inch screen. They, so how are we going to get the payments? So our voice technology dreams, really the challenge is going to be how do we raise the money either generated or get investment to develop the technology for the voice purchasing. How about you, Drew? Um, my biggest problem, and there's a couple people in the room here that are working with us now that can relate to this, is the painful uh, listening to the inventor try to explain how it works. Yes. And so uh, 
when I when I went to the funny story I used is when I was doing the CRM example, it was a it was it was a friendly contact, and the woman was told Drew's thing is going to change what you're doing, and she's like, sure, sure. So I met with her and I explained to her what it does, and at the end of it, she goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so luckily there was a good connection, and she gave us another Skype meeting, and we we made some new diagrams to explain it. She goes, Drew, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> now at this point, I was like, wow, I'm really wearing out this relationship. So then I said, what, do you, what are you doing and what do you want? And that changed everything. Because what it was is we stopped telling people how it works and we started telling what it does. And then it was a big shift of, you know, when I would show it, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, it saves a lot of time. And then one of the people who were demonstrating said, well, Drew, how many screens is it saving? And we're like, oh, well, here's, here's how we modeled it out. Drew, do you realize that was 23 screens? Do you know how much information my user didn't get? Because they would have quit at five screens. So then, so really that shift um, was, a big, was a big part of it. And everybody wants to be part of something revolutionary. Well, before it's adopted, <laughs> it's crazy. So um, the good thing is the US Patent Office uh, um, you know, validated it and it's a very wide craziness. And uh, we've got PCT preliminary approval and our provisional that was on top of it, a second layer, um, actually the European office came back and said, oh no, that's in violation with Track 180's path. So um, it shows that we've, we've got something kind of neat, but it was really conveying the message, so thank you. And you see that going forward too, that kind of understanding of what it can do for them, or have you now got the, the model for how you well, could the, crack that? As one of the advisors we were working with, when, um, when they get the aha moment of, wow, this works on everything, it was, well, what are you gonna go after? It's everything. Yeah. Well, that, that doesn't work. So, so picking the beachheads that we're going to go into, um, for us, it actually has such huge value that we, we can be very opportunistic in the, the, the quicker adopters um, can, we can just do it. Um, so um, as, as we get growing, we have the ability to just cascade this into a whole bunch of verticals. Managing that, the right team, which was brought up a lot, is going to be everything. Um, and so surrounding yourself with the team is going to be, we feel, our biggest, our biggest uh, challenge. challenge. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of the specific market segment or structure that you're dealing with, what have been uh, those characteristics that have been most frustrating? Uh, Nadav, will you start us out? Because you're dealing in a space that, as you say, has this, you know, Uber, Lyft, sidecar on the mobile side, mm -hmm. but a very antiquated balance. Yeah. No, totally. It's a very uh, currently a very low tech market, and. Um, I guess one, one of the characteristics of it that also poses a challenge is uh, that uh, these people using the software are, you know, they've had Jim the dispatcher using, you know, limo is uh, for the last 15 years and they already know how to do it. So um, they, it, it's selling high tech software to a low tech industry is, uh, you know, one of the characteristics of what we're selling to. It's not, these people aren't necessarily the early adopters. Um, and so, uh, I guess one of the ways that we've been really uh, focusing on that is really digitizing the whole education process and figuring out a really good sales funnel. Uh, there's really cool tools, tools out there. Like, um, I'm not sure if you guys use Intercom or Customer.io, where you can, uh, it's like a developer's automated CRM where you can figure out like a bunch of different uh, parameters of different points in the sales funnel and then have emails automate to them. So if you have someone, let's say, create a, free trial, but they didn't add a driver, you have an automatic email going up to them, hey, by the way, I saw you created a free, tri free trial, but you didn't add a driver, can we set up a workshop to show you how to do that? And so the education process has been super important to us for these people who don't necessarily, uh, you know, they're not tech first kind of, right. uh, kind of industry. John, what about you? Because you've had this pharma versus, uh, you know, the technology issue. How has it played out in the segment, particularly with TV? Um, yeah, I was speaking more to the, the investment yep. side of it. Yeah, so our, our customer, it's kind of strange. So the uh, FINE, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, they basically are in charge of the, the Gates money that's being used to develop TB diagnostics. So that, that funnels through FINE. So we have to, so they're kind of our customer because they're going to help us test and they're going to recommend it in conjunction with the WHO. So what we need is an endorsement from them and then they sort of own the, uh, the low resource, uh, the high burden, market so we market through them so they, they understand exactly what we're doing but I think that the challenge is um, I'm not sure if this is speaking to your question exactly but the challenge is 
getting to the point where they, we can prove to them that our solution works. If our solution works, they're going to be super interested, and, but they are funding others, and we have to um, show why our fairly simple but clever technology is, is better than what these other companies are coming up with. We know on this, our specs are better, but we have to show that we can do it, and it's really just being a small company that they don't know versus a giant global conglomerate that says, yeah, we're going to just give us the 20 million and we'll do it. Um, and the other thing that I recall from our earlier conversations is you also decided you would likely launch overseas first to accelerate your positioning because of the FDA regs. Yeah, so the market barriers are very interesting. You know, for an instrument like this, there, if we're going to go in this country, FDA, that's a couple of year long barrier. Um, WHO and the fine barrier are, are lower. There's another low barrier uh, avenue where we're looking at now, which is the military, DARPA, and DITRA fund a lot of stuff like this. And that they have their own barrier. We basically, if they're happy with our test data and our, our, our specs and our performance, they'll adopt and they don't need any other agency. So that's one of the lower bars. And luckily we have someone on our SAB who's been working with those organizations for, for many years. So we're hoping that might be lower bar. So part of it is like picking that low bar market that understands what we can do for them exactly. and is easy and easier customer because of the lower bar. How about you, Larissa? Um, so one of the, um, the things that we, it's all around sales. Our biggest issues are all around sales. So one is finding the right person to sell to. Don't give me the name of the CTO. Tech people are looking for major integrations, that SAP implementation. We want to sell to the marketer. So then even within the marketing function, who are you talking to? Mobile is so new, it's very rare that you actually have a VP of mobile, and let alone a VP of mobile commerce. Right? The, the other part of it is the um, group, getting group, that's why I started the pitch by going, we have nothing to do with NFC, mobile wallets, we're not an app, right? So that's that whole, you know, you want to put us in a box someplace, we're new technology, so you, it's hard to explain. And I, I say to my sales guy when I, guys when I try to give them a little um, pep talk is, imagine you're Larry and Sergey, and you're going in to the first clients, and you're trying, because I think I'm Larry and Sergey, I know. I am, you know, very humble. And so you're going in and you're telling them, all right, so this is thing called the internet, and you don't even really know what it is because it's all at universities right now. But that's a lot of information, and you have no way of figuring out what it is. So imagine you go to a library, and you flip into the card catalog, and you pull out the thing that you need. That's what Google is, right? So that's, you know, one of the things trying to communicate what we do in the mobile commerce space, finding the right person, not getting grouped in that, into that bucket. Uh, <clears throat> for us, uh, you know, we've, the company of our new direction on the enterprise platform is only not even five months old. So um, it's been a, a huge um, cultural shift. Um, we've done a great job of connecting with some, some good people that are going to help us. But it's really, um, our challenge right now is really the people. And as we're getting the introductions and once they get it, it's the, the response has been pretty amazing. So it's us being able to... Um, Deliver what we we you know we we've uh, prototyped and built, and um, I think it's really going to be the people. Um, I think the when we show a use case, there's no once you play with it, there's there's not a lot. Um, so I think uh, we're going to need to be with the innovators uh, in the space. We've dealt with some document management companies um, that this is an absolute game changer. The problem is you're talking about a dinosaur space. So finding the 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 software provider that is actually the the, the company that that you know we'll say Recoil is working with you know with Westbrook Software over here, um, you know that's where we're going to get our entry point. It's not going to be at the front door of you know one of the larger companies. And, and the the insurance modeling and the medical modeling we've done is just it's it's amazing. But we know as it was mentioned earlier, I think Bill was talking about the insurance industry has a long way to go. So we really need to team up with some some innovators. Um, and uh, luckily for us, there's a lot of them out there. But we're just starting, so we'll see those challenges as we get going. Okay, the next is what are the particular challenges in mobile that you've faced? Do you want to start us, Nava? Sure. Um, so I think this is kind of something that anyone in mobile will relate to pretty easily, um, is that the fact that when it, if you're creating a website, you can create one code base, and it can be accessed from any browser, any device, anywhere. But when you're starting going mobile first, you have you know, you create the iPhone, the you know, on Objective C, and you create Android using Java. Uh, if you create, you can create Windows too. Uh, most people don't, but you can. Um, and 
So and it's just managing these these separate code bases, and you don't want to release beyond like version three of iOS while you're on version one of Android. And so you have to have teams that can work really well together at the same pace. And um, you know there there's certain components that are Android specific and you know iPhone specific, but overall the general theme of it you need it to be really consistent moving forward and having two completely separate teams with two completely separate skills doing one uh, one specific project. I think it's uh, one of the, the biggest hurdles of uh, going mobile first. Marissa, um, one of the big things is um, talking to potential customers when they think because mobile is so new they check the box, right? Their CEO or their SVP is like, we have to be on mobile. There was only 2% traffic two years ago, now it's 40%, you gotta get with the program, you gotta do something. All right, I'll build a mobile site. So when we call them up, they're like, I already have a mobile site. Okay, so this is 1997. Did you only have a website? Or did you also do search and email and uh, display advertising? So the issue is they just check the box on mobile because it's so new. They don't have the expertise or the resources to actually really do a good job with their mobile um, footprint. Um, so that's, that's one of the issues. The other big, big, huge issue is about customer behavior on mobile. Right, so then you see it when you look at um, companies that just took their desktop site and they shrunk it down to four and a half inches, and they didn't actually take out what users do on a phone. And one example is, one example is, I know you're laughing. Um, there's not a lot of, um, uh, you know, browsing on a phone. It's all about task completion, and that's very difficult for branders at the big retail. Think about Victoria's Secret. It's all about image. You're not going to see angels with wings half dressed or you know 10% dressed on a phone and people are watching them. well maybe you guys are watching the fashion show but a lot of people aren't buying off of that they want to go in and say I need some new clothing let me just get it and be done so that's another thing it's evolving because it's just so new I would say the multiple platforms I think some of the standardization is really I mean I look back a couple years when you know we were we started the project on for the iPad and crossing over from iPad to iPhone was a huge deal um, that's really starting to narrow, and I think um, in some of the people I met, um, in the connections I had out in, in Barcelona, the, you're seeing the huge development where that's, that's actually, the people that are in the mobile space only that are developing for multiple companies are actually really developing some pretty cool things that will make that a little bit easier. Um, our biggest issue is, is really uh, normalizing the data depending on whose database we're tying into. So, but I, I think there's some hope in the, in the mobile that will actually even catapult um, the, the expansion even in greater because right now I meet a lot of people it's like well we decided to go with Android or we decided to go with with iPhone and that's that's huge and it's also where are you in the world like the US iPhones pretty dominant you go the rest of the world it's not the case so though so for a company to launch on a global basis and actually just be able to do it easier is I think going to even add more fuel All right. how about you John so I um, I see our big challenges as one is the format of the data we upload on there. It, the mm -hmm. health, health and epidemiological data is not that standardized. And the other issue is patient privacy. Even if we anonymize data, if you know at, at this date and at this location you had a positive test or something, then there might, there might be ways to figure out who, who that was. So protecting, how do we protect patient privacy? That's probably the biggest single thing because we really want the aggregate data and, but that's not going to happen unless um, we address the, the first part. Now, each of you pursued a different pathway to your mobile development. What I'd like you to do is talk about, you know, how you chose your developer, where they're located, how you interact with them. You want to start us off? Sure. So, um, so just to reiterate, um, you know, a lot of these guys have apps, so we are browser-based. So Lightning Bytes browser base is specifically not an app, so we don't have to deal with the standardization across all platforms. Um, and from a consumer behavior perspective, right, I started my career at Time Inc. as a consumer marketer, so that's part of my DNA. I'm always thinking about the user. And um, it's browser based, it's browser first. The actual app download and usage is very small unless you're an Amazon, unless you're a news reader like the New York Times app. So we wanted to get spread. So, um, so in terms of that, we needed to find uh, bra mobile browser developers. And um, because we were initially bootstrapped, cost was a huge factor. So I could spend 
hundred dollars an hour for a US based developer or I could outsource and I heard all of the nightmare stories every single one of them and you know knowledge is power so I um, went out to my network and I, I said you know I'm looking for a, a, a development company and this is what you need to have experience with ecom mobile but mobile browser native app because a lot of the um, innovations are going to come that way and we need to adapt it for the mobile browser and and then my query said you had to have personally worked with the person that you're recommending. I don't want your sister's brother's cousin's aunt that you heard does something like this in Sri Lanka, right? So I got a short list, I did extensive vetting, and um, our, uh, most of our dev is done in the Ukraine, and they're 450 miles away from Kiev, in case, because I know you're gonna ask that. And um, nobody's been called up to the Ukrainian army, but we also do have a couple of developers here, including my CTO, she's in Boston. Um, so our developers are in Connecticut, a bit of a ways from Ukraine, um, but we actually got them all from uh, through different networks through UConn. Got them all uh, as a as a UConn student went to Startup Week in stores, went to different student organizations that were based around um, computer science. We went to um, the actual like the dean of engineering and asked him to shoot him emails. We would ask around our own networks there, like, do you know anyone who's really good at MongoDB, really good at Java? Um, if we heard someone through him a text, hey, you want to grab a beer? I'm working on something. No college student's going to turn down a beer. Um, and so that, and we kind of just like really just leveraging the UConn resources, we were able to put together a nice little team. So I highly re recommend that to everyone is like look into UConn, look into the, the engineering program there. There's some super talented people and catching them. Their senior year is perfect. It's when they have a really good, uh, they got all the basic skills down, but it's before they got that job at a huge company. Uh, so it's a good time to like motivate them to join a, a cool little startup. Um, for us, when we, were, when we were initially looking at it, the, the complexity of our CMS was completely <coughs> custom. So um, it changed our querying quite a bit, and it brought us to some, some of the bigger players out there. And we ended up with a company in Barcelona called uh, Golden Gecko. And they just were coming up with these really high rankings and you know, like the Budweiser uh, World Cup they're doing. So they did all this custom things and, um, but I was afraid of the offshore. I don't speak Spanish. Um, I barely speak English that well. So it was, I was really worried about the project management. And uh, my background was fast track project management and in dealing with these people, I went there twice, visited them in person, visited with the team, the lead developers and their project management. It ended up being one of the best project management companies I've ever dealt with. Um, so uh, the, the technology level of what they needed to do, um, the querying, their performance of exactly what they built was important. Um, and so uh, it ended up being a great relationship and all of our vendor relationship, there's a list that are terrible. This was an amazing one. And then as we go into our future development, they ended up being purchased by a company called DMI, which actually um, is out of Bethesda, Maryland, that does all 15 branches of the US government. Um, whether it be missile systems or enterprise software. So our ability to have a strategic partner that can develop and QA any project that we're looking to do is was kind of, it's been going very well for us. Um, and until, of course, um, you know, we'll end up doing our own soon enough, but um, it's, it, it, it gives us, out of all the worries we need to do in design and, and, and sales, it, we don't have to worry about our QA. Uh, passing reference in his, uh, presentation earlier, uh, there's a lot of, let us call them trolls, out there that prey on younger companies. So I'm interested in what your process was as you filed your patents, the counsel you got. Um, tell us a little bit about how you avoided that, uh, the, the pitfalls. You want to start, Nito? Sure. We actually, um, we, we went through this, um, uh, one of our advisors has actually started a, a company called patentory.com and it actually is a really is a really cool platform where you can go in and write up your uh, your uh, patent pending application and uh, use the figures and everything right next to it and it gives you all the you know the standards for what, what patent pending needs to look like and then you submit it to them and they have a group of uh, mm -hmm. attorneys that look it over and make sure it all um, make sure that it all complies, and then uh, you work with that group of attorneys and, th and they send it in for you. So, um, patentory worked for us. And Carissa? Um, so I got a, a, one of my advisors worked with a patent attorney who was on his own, um, but the benefit of working with Scott was that he uh, wrote and was a co 
inventor for multiple mobile patents when he was at Microsoft. So he actually knew mobile, he worked for a very large company, he was an attorney, and I got him for bargain basement rates. Are we sensing a theme here? <laughs> um, so I get experts, but not a lot of money. So um, that's how we found Scott. Good. John? Um, so uh, what I did was I filed provisionals myself. I, I have like 40 patents I wrote a lot for myself, so it wasn't that big, I mean, it's, it's hard work, but yeah. it's the lowest cost way to do it. And the nice thing about the provisionals is, Nobody sees them for a year. You've got a year to convert, nobody sees them. If you want to be stealth, it's a good way to do it. Um, it's very low cost. So what I did is after, as the provisional was within, you know, about six months of coming due, I, I hired a, a sort of a freelance attorney to basically rewrite it in an acceptable format and convert it to actually PCT applications. So that's how, we, how we're handling it. And Drew, you've got a patent granted. Tell us about your um, process. I think the, the, the most important thing for us was actually selecting the right uh, firm. Uh, first of all, I do not speak or write or even barely read patentese. Um, it was the best go to sleep material I've ever I've ever had. But um, what we had was uh, we worked with a firm out of Boston specialized in technology. And the key thing was is having that attorney that knew his stuff draw out of the idea as much as possible. And that was probably one of the most valuable things because uh, I think I remember one of the aspects of our, you know, what we've patented is basically navigating from one stream of information to another stream of information through a specific segment. And our biggest, um, in our, in our uh, prosecution phase was actually Google's related search. And what it turned into is ours is far more multidimensional than Google's related search. Um, so when we did that, my streams were actually time, because I was building a news app. Um, and I remember we were in a certain phase and he goes, well, Drew, give me a non-time example. Everything's time. You know, I was in news, news, news. He goes, no, you got to give me a non-time example. And it took me two weeks to figure it out. And that's when it opened up a lot of doors. Was basically it was food. It was like, oh, a theme. Oh, that's what you meant. So if it if it wasn't for me working with him and him being patient and really knowing his stuff, we would have narrowed our path. Um, and so I think that depending on what you have. Um, that is probably one of the most uh, important things to really work your way up the ladder. If it's very specific, um, I think that's, that narrows you know, the demand. But if you've got something that's kind of uh, broad, that, is, that was the best money I've spent. And it was a lot. I mean, it was a lot of money. Uh, we did pay for the, uh, we uh, expedited it. That's why it was done in just a little over three years. PCT approval and whatnot is, is taking longer. We selected our countries and all that already of preliminary approval, but um, I think if you got something that's really broad and you don't know it, I mean, you know what you're doing. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Um, and so, you know, that's easy. But um, having that good attorney really draw that out, I think, is important. Good. Um, the next question is about funding. And obviously, in the past five years, with Recession 2.0, venture capital has become risk averse. We've seen fewer and fewer dollars going into early stage companies. I mean, mobile is not as bad as other uh, areas, but we've still seen uh, problems there in the early stage. Um, so it's meant angels have taken up the slack to some degree with early stage. I'd be interested in each of you talking a little bit about how that's impacted you, how it may have made you shift your funding strategy. You want to start, Nadav? Sure. Well so we've been mostly self-funded. We just opened up an angel note recently, um, but we never went the VC route anyway. Um, so I really don't know much about the VC world, honestly, so I, I don't much to say about it. But um, yeah, so, so we're, we're working on our angel note right now. Self-funded, and was it a friends and family angel, or did you actually go out into an angel network when you um, um, got your angel round? So we, we worked off a few grants in the beginning, yeah. um, and then some family friend stuff. Okay. John? We were self-funded about the first six, well, it, it turned out being the first year. It took us, I guess, one thing is it took us a lot longer than we thought to get the first round, but I have to say, it, um, it, I mean, it was our responsibility to be able to deliver what the investors, need, or the investor, the angel investor needed and what CI needed, so I don't feel like it took longer than it should have based on where we were. Right. I mean, we, we are engineers and scientists who solve technical problems, and then we have to understand that investors want to see you 
and um, you, you had, show sorry. the business case. Go ahead. You had identified your angel fairly early on, as I recall. Fairly early, yeah. We started working with him in like May, and yeah. then we finally closed. In, basically, about the end of the year, so that was we got the commitment. How about you, Carissa? You got local angels too, right? So the first money in, uh, besides my own, was um, somebody who I worked for. So you know, I guess I qualified as friends and family. Um, and then he brought in his co-founder from uh, a previous company, and that you know that was huge validation. Then I went out to um, the angel networks, and the term sheet that I referenced before was from a large angel network. Um, and then I you know turned that money down, and I thought, all right, I'm going to do the circuit, the springboard, the women 2.0, and I'm going to get all these introductions to VCs, which I did. They delivered, and every VC meeting said every single VC meeting. Um, I'm like, we have clients. They're paying clients, even though they're beta clients. They've agreed to pay us. And you get some 20-year-old who says, that's not a big deal. And I, oh, really? <laughs> okay, well, clearly I must be doing something wrong because that's pretty hard. And then they all said, get some clients and revenue and then come back. And I'm thinking to myself, if I have clients and revenue, I don't need you. <laughs> so that's where we are. And now we're just looking to raise money to grow. We're going to hit break even this year. We want to go faster. Sure. Um, mine was uh, self-funded. Um, very dangerous combination of self-funding it, being the inventor and passionate about the project you're working on. Um, my advice, um, and, and you know, we created something amazing out of it, but the, the, the benefit that I've learned in the last, say, six months is getting an advisor board um, to put up money to validate your idea. Um, I think the, the ability to hear all the reasons it's not gonna work and talk to people who are, are not drunk on the Kool-Aid and um, through the, you know, the, the Google glasses that you're wearing, to, that it's gonna make it a great idea. Um, so, I mean, as we're going forward, we're, we're getting, a, I mean, things have changed quite a bit in our, our business model tremendously and the patent validates it and the, the, the joint venture opportunities and different things are, it really changed a lot. But for anybody, I mean, there's a lot of experienced people in this room, you probably know that, but living it firsthand, um, getting uh, a group of people to agree with you is one thing, getting the people to poke the holes in it and really poke holes in it and be open to that is very important. Um, so for us, as we go forward, I'm seeing more value in the investor, um, even if you don't need the money, to actually help validate what you're doing. And um, so that that's, uh, I think it's been very interesting. We, we, we talked with a couple of VC just by the introductions and it was, you know, it's exactly what we said. We're not there. It was just a friendly introductions and some conversation. But I think, uh, I think uh, for any company to get some outside investment that is not friends and family is, is probably more valuable than the, the check they're going to be writing, especially in the early phases. Um, I wanted to ask each of you to comment on whether or not you'd be interested in taking on a strategic investor. As you know, after the internet bubble, people uh, that were strategic investors just exited the market in droves and now they're beginning to come back in mobile. And right now we've committed uh, 100 million to a healthcare fund. We've committed uh, 100 million in China alone. And you know the problem is we go places, you sit on a panel with four people like this and the problem is we love them all. And, but we have a different objective than some of you in the room. Our secondary objective is making money. I mean, we love all of our investments to make money. The primary one is really to accelerate time to market for products and services that we think will be beneficial to our two core businesses, which is licensing and chipsets. So we therefore would have a bit of a different approach, which is, you know, if it was all about making money, we see so many things every day that we'd want to pop that venture fund up to a, a much bigger number. But it's, you know, we're going to be opportunistic to get the right things going in healthcare. So it's not about having a huge mass in healthcare. It's Okay, this one's focused on diabetes. So I was thinking you, you should have, uh, we have a Qualcomm X quarter, uh, tri-quarter X prize uh, competition going on now. 10 million bucks for the first person who can come up with diagnosing uh, six medical conditions non-invasively. And so we do things like that to try to stimulate the innovation, but then move away and really let the industry uh, innovate around it. So we're, we're very active around the world and specifically here in the U.S. in uh, uh, not just the U.S., but uh, healthcare in particular. And if I could just yeah. underscore your point so strongly that you can put the sky is blue in the description of your patent. You can put anything you want in the description. It's the claims that actually give you the right to the invention. We have an on, on average 30 uh, claims per patent. And if one claim of one patent is invoked, we're on our full royalty. So that 
description of why you have the exclusive right and the more claims you can have in there is it's been the hallmark for our business. So I just wanted to underscore your point there. Very good. Um, so let's start. Chris, are you thinking you would take a strategic investment if you were offered one, or what is your take on it right now? I can't think of a better investment partner than a strategic investor because they're potentially going to use your product either initially or down the road, and they get it. So it, there's not a lot of educating of that <coughs> stakeholder that you have to do. They can immediately recognize the value in what you're doing. And for us, it's an email, constant contact, right? You can sell directly from the email campaign. It's Google, because again, I think big. And you know, why wouldn't you sell directly from the search results? Google has a venture fund, right? So we will be approaching them, so you know, absolutely. Um, it's, we, we've, uh, we're not really sure. Okay. Because it's really, um, we, we have something that is um, across so many verticals and it's, it's a very broad patent. I'm just going to reference real quick my history again. Um, I look at data as, like in, you know, 200 years ago, our biggest data source was a library. And they got pretty big. And as they got pretty big, there wasn't a, a set way. It was the standard way of doing it. Um, so these large data sources would get confusing and harder to access. And then Dewey Decimal... Mr. Dewey invented a, a, an amazing way of categorizing books. Um, our method is actually the three-dimensional way of, of really efficiently categorizing data sets in, in, in unlimited form. So we've had some potential meetings with some, some bigger clients. And um, at this point, at five months, we're not ready. My advisor board isn't strong enough. My team isn't strong enough to really sit down and not waste people's time. So we're, 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 we're on our way to that, unfortunately. John? Yeah, I think uh, we would be open to it, especially if it, it's the right partner that helps us target. Because right now, I mean, we think we have the best target and our strategic investor, we, we have them picked out and we're talking with them, an, an NGO, right? So we think that's the right path for us. But depending, you know, we have a broadly applicable platform, so there, there could be uh, other options. In there. Yeah, we're uh, absolutely open to it as well. I think there's, um, yeah, depending on the partner, there's a lot of value to be added there, uh, more than just capital. And I think especially if there's a certain partner that you can um, leverage to get into a larger distribution, they already have the distribution mechanism and you have the, the software and I think there could be a really cool fit there. Um, and I think there's a lot of companies out there that um, we, you know, we'd be able to uh, add value to like that. You each got some money from uh, Connecticut Innovations, the DECD, and I wonder if we could just go right across the panel and actually state the amount of money and what the grant was to give credit, because many of the folks who uh, are advising on those grants are sitting in the audience, and we'd like to give some uh, a heads up and a thank you for that. Neda? Um, yeah, so we got uh, $33,000 from the Kinetic Innovations. So that was, that was huge. That was really early on for us, so uh, that helped us accelerate quite a bit. Um, we got the 30K grant from CCAT as well. Uh, also really helpful, uh, also accelerated um, the actual development of our product. Um, and then we got 10K from the voucher program from Innovation East, um, and that was also really helpful. And then um, we, we worked with, um, we, were all, we were also part of TIP, which was uh, really helpful for us early on. It, it's what brought us um, into the larger Connecticut network, and it's what um, really got us pumped up to continue, and uh, it, they had CEO meetings every week. And, John? Yeah. So um, we have uh, the pre-seed fund, which is 75 uh, given plus another 75 committed, just based on when we uh, use up the first at, as uh, planned. And, uh, and will they match your SBIR grant if you're fortunate enough to get it? Yeah, they'll add 30 to that. Um, I think we don't apply for that until we get it. Yeah, we will, and we've applied for the CBIF fund, which is a not quite totally defined fund, but it's designed to help you get from pre-seed to seed, because one of the challenges with pre-seed money, it's not really enough to staff up. You know, I don't want to hire people that I can only pay for three months. So um, that, that could be very helpful in getting us to the uh, seed round. Good. Drew? We did 100000 with the DECD program, um, $10,000 in the boat voucher, and we qualified for the Connecticut Digital Media Tax Credits. Um, so. Angel tax credits. No, no. The, this the is the oh, the digital the media. Di the digital yeah. media, which is 30% uh, on our, bend, uh, our spend in, that qualifies for right. Connecticut. Right. And that's an ongoing certification program and um, quite an interesting process, but it's, it's, uh, it's very beneficial to be in Connecticut with that program. Probably one of the most beneficial programs 
um, I've seen in any of the states that we've looked at. So digital media tax credit, it's, it's basically why uh, Indiana Jones was filmed at Yale. Um, motion picture and expanded into digital media, and so um, it's 30% on your qualified spend in Connecticut. Arista? Um, so we got 30,000 grant from uh, CCAT. We got um, 202,000 in grants and loans from DECD, um, 10,000 voucher program, and we qualified for the um, angel tax credit in Connecticut. So an enormously helpful. Okay. Um, we're going to, in the interest of time, let them give you answers about what they would advise other companies to do. You've had a few suggestions as we've gone along here, but at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Yes, sir. question was, have any of the panelists taken money from outside Connecticut? Anybody? Um, so we pitched uh, So we pitched here in Connecticut initially when we were looking at angel rounds. And what, what I found, again, this was a couple of years ago, so mobile wasn't very sophisticated and people didn't have a lot of experience. But the bias in Connecticut was life science and, you know, life tech and then heavy, you know, manufacturing technology. So people just didn't understand what we were doing and didn't get it. So then we, I spent all of my time in New York, and like I said, we pitched three times and we got a term sheet. So it was much quicker, just people just knew what we were doing more. Um, Way in the back. Uh, yes, I, guess. Uh, I come from a digital technology startup background, and I guess one of the questions that I have, uh, maybe for the whole panel, is um, when you uh, quantified your demand and value proposition, did you uh, really uh, look at the audience first and then build the product, or did you build the product and then find the audience? I'll, I'll speak on that one. Track 180, the news app, was uh, I built the product. And um, you know that, that led to a pivot. Um, as we're going forward, um, it's the, you know, we've modeled out several different things so we could build 10 use case scenarios and the customer's gonna want use case 11. So now that we have a, a, a working prototype, now it'll be based on, on what the customer wants specifically. Uh, we started with the customer, um, but did constant iteration. So we'll start with, you know, what's your you know, number one need, and then built that one functionality, then go back, get a few more, what's your number one need, and then just constantly release MVPs of different actual functionality with the product. Spencer? Uh, John, what struck me from your presentation, you know, as I'm looking at the four of you, you're dealing with things that have some measure of ephemerality, right, especially information. But you're dealing with something that's a bio uh, material as well. So as you went through your presentation, three words came to my mind, and you addressed one, privacy. The other, though, you said interchangeably the word device and accuracy, it's not perfect, so you do get false positives and false negatives. So recalibration, I would think, is key over time as these devices the other thing would then be disposal of the sample. Do you have potentially exceedingly hazardous material that's being analyzed? Yeah, so we. If you could address those items, that would be. Sure. Um, the second one, in terms of hazardous materials, there, there are no hazardous materials. The, the sample is immediately rendered um, non active. Basically, the sample is immediately killed when it's in the uh, sample prep part of the uh, system. So there's also, you know, most, almost every other instrument that uses. Uh, that does DNA identification, the, the dyes they use are actually quite hazardous. They're mutagenic because they clamp onto DNA. We have a dye, this is fairly new technology. We have a dye that it's, it's not something we develop, but it's completely safe because it can't cross a cell boundary. So we have a completely safe disposable. And that's a really good point because in the third world, there isn't that red biohazard can, right? That, that assay is gonna get thrown out somewhere. So. Um, that's really important. That's a good question, and we've addressed that. And I'm sorry, what was the uh, about the device accuracy over time? So, negative, so that's really uh, obviously the initial performance is very well defined. If we don't hit certain uh, sensitivity and specificity standards, it, it won't be adopted. And we know exactly what those need to be. Um, in terms of over time, there'll be calibration disks that that'll be run. That'll and every single disk has uh, positive and negative controls built onto it. So. You, if it doesn't detect a positive control, obviously the, the test results are, are going to be null. And uh, same with if the negative control comes up positive, again, the test is null. So there's internal controls, and then there's also will be calibration. So if you, if you just 
distribute hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these around the world? Are you downloading software that then these things test themselves again? Or how is that, again, that calibration? Those, so the kit, the assay kit, will be where the, 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 the positive and negative controls are in every assay kit. So the disposable will come with the controls needed. Um, I'd like to take one more question. Uh, the entire panel is going to stay throughout the networking in the cafe, so uh, if you haven't had your question answered, hang tight. I think you'll agree with me that um, this whole area of uh, mobile and mobile uh, development is clearly an exciting area um, to me who is not uh, a technical person uh, by any means it's virtually breathtaking to uh, think of where the opportunities are given the conversations uh, that we've heard today already so what I would um, simply like to do is um, thank you all for coming uh, please stay and enjoy the opportunity to uh, talk to one another and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in the future